Okay, welcome everybody to a, a prompt start right at 1115 for our next session that we have today. So very excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Bob Grabowski. Um, I am a managing director at Deloitte uh, and I lead Deloitte's uh, public sector intelligent automation practice. I've had a lot of experience deploying RPA and some of the intelligent automation tools across the government, including the uh, very first bot that went into production at NASA uh, about five or six years ago at this point. Um, but we're very excited here today to, to talk a little bit more than just bots and, and RPA. Uh, so today's focus is going to be on AI and finance. Well, what does that actually mean? What does it look like? What are some examples of use cases where um, we can go beyond the bots, moving beyond RPA? And that's not to diminish the value that RPA has brought. Um, I think what we're looking at now is that RPA is a well-established uh, uh, accelerator and tool that many of you in this room and, and on the phone have used. I mean, we'll continue to use. And as a matter of fact, spoiler alert, some of our panelists are only using RPA right now, but have aspirations to go beyond RPA. Uh, what I think we're, we're seeing with RPA is that um, it, it is not giving back all of the returns that you can achieve by combining it with other intelligent automation uh, technologies and other AI capabilities. So that's really what we are here to talk about today. Um, I'm only going to do a very little presenting, and then I'm going to let you hear from our four panelists. And we have two on the phone, on Zoom, and, and two in the room today. Um, so first, we have Adam Goldberg, who is on, on the phone. Um, he is the acting uh, assistant commissioner for uh, FIT over at the Department of Treasury. Uh, we have Bob Pucci, also on the phone, um, who, who serves as the executive director for intelligent automation for the state of Tennessee. Uh, we have Holly Donnelly here with us today, who is the director of the uh, strategy and business solutions um, at IRS. And Bill Collinson here as well, who is the uh, division chief for systems data analytics, or data analysis and business solutions at Census Bureau. So exciting to have them here today. They're all going to talk. I'm going to let them introduce themselves here in a moment. And they're all going to talk about their journey and what they're doing. And as you can see, we've got a nice diverse uh, um, uh, panel today, right? We've got some folks from state government. Um, Holly, who actually doesn't sit within finance, however, uh, has a major strategy position within um, an organization focused around finance. We'll talk a little about, bit about her journey as well. We have Adam and, and Bill as well talk a little bit about the process and technology stuff that they're seeing. So before we get in there, we wanted to uh, frame this discussion a little bit. So we wanted to bring this one single slide, and then we're going to get to the questions. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the artificial intelligence spectrum. And, and those of you who've, who've dabbled in RPA or, or in the AI spectrum have probably seen something similar to this. What I love about this slide is it probably put, you know, really uh, puts into perspective where um, we are from the, the government perspective, the public sector perspective, and how much more there is to go. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time going through what this slide shows. But as you can see, um, in the bottom corner of uh, you know, the RPA, that rules-based automation, that is really just hitting you know, the, the, uh, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, uh, for using AI and really you know, getting the benefits beyond RPA. Um, as you can see on the maturity scale, from mature to emerging, RPA very mature. I would guess if I had, was able to see everyone who's dialed into this and asked for a show of hands, I would see a majority of folks are, uh, are, are doing something with RPA, if, if not everybody. As you start moving up, you start introducing new technologies and, and start thinking about some of, of what they could do within, the, um, you know, within the, the processes that you all lead. So the next one up, the intelligent automation spectrum, we're talking about things like OCR, you know, optical character recognition, um, scripted bots, um, a little bit of natural language processing. So this is taking you know, those traditional rules-based bots and in introducing new technologies to read forms, uh, to interpret uh, data and language in order to make decisions. Um, as you can see, and, and there are probably some of you in this room that, that are already using some of those tools or at least exploring using those tools. Those are the, very, the, the natural progression when it comes to the, uh, the AI spectrum to go to next. And you'll hear a little bit about some use cases from our panel in those areas. As you start working up the chain to cognitive analytics, narrow AI, general AI, um, you start talking about some really cool technologies that can really change the game with what we do. Um, you know, as you look up, you're, you're, you talk about speech and image recognition, thinking about interactive chat bots, the ability for um, you know, computers and conversational AI to interpret words that we use, um, emotions that we have in order to provide recommendations and in order to, to provide data to, to all the participants. As you move up even more, you start talking about the cool stuff, the deep learning, 
quantum learning where you're, you're thinking about things. I read a use case where uh, UPS was trying to do some deep learning to figure out how to get their drivers with the fewest amount of turns to their ro- you know, on their routes because turns consumed more gas than driving straight, you know, the stopping and accelerating. So they were looking at geospatial information. They were looking at route maps. They were looking at gas prices. They were looking at location. And they were combining all of that data in one uh, you know, very specific uh, need in order to try to save money for uh, you know, the, the company that basically focuses on, on driving around and delivering packages. So that, when you start getting up into that quadrant, as you can see, a lot of this is still emerging. A lot of this doesn't exist today. And of course, what we want to do in this session today is focus on how these technologies can be used for finance and for the, uh, for the work that you all are doing within your finance organizations, and, and hopefully spark some discussion and thought about what those actually may be and think about some of what those use cases may be. I will finish by saying one of the major benefits of BOT, RPA in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, has always been the amount of, uh, of time and effort and, and savings that, that can be returned back to the workforce. You know, it's about taking human functions, allowing a, a computer to do them, and returning those hours back. As you move up the spectrum, while that continues to be um, you know, a, a major driver of benefit and impact, um, you start introducing newer benefits. And, and thinking about these technologies differently is required. You're not thinking about how can I demonstrate a cost savings. You're thinking about how can I actually use the, you know, combine the, the human labor with the computer in order to, to deliver a differentiated experience for my organization and you know, for many of you for your customers. So we're grounded in that today. I'm going to turn it over to the, to the panelists here and let them introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to ask them to just give a quick introduction. And then um, if they could also talk a little bit about maybe where they are on this spectrum. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for Q&A just to get your, your all's thoughts on this. Um, I will say we're monitoring the questions that come in, so I have those in front of me. So as you have additional questions, either those of you virtually or those of you in the room, please log them into the site, and uh, we'll go from there. So why don't we start, Holly, why don't you kick us off in the room and uh, give us a little bit more about what you do and a little bit about your journey. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, my name is Holly Donnelly. I started out with the IRS as an economist uh, a long, long time ago, and I've done stints in the CFO office at GSA, where I was in budget, and at the Department of Labor, where I was in performance management. And then I returned to the IRS, where um, I've been into data and analytics in the strategy and business solutions office, and we work closely with um, the IT office to help the operating divisions at the IRS implement database solutions. So, Excellent. Thanks for inviting me today. Thank you very much, Holly. All right, why don't we go to uh, Bob Pucci. Are you out there? We can't see you. Can you hear us? Bob cannot hear us. Okay, Bob is not with us. Okay, I'm getting this view from the back. All right, let's go to Adam. Adam, are you out there for us? I am out here for you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Adam Goldberg. Uh, I am uh, running the Office of Financial Innovation and Transformation at the Bureau of the Fiscal Service, uh, where our responsibility is to identify, incubate, and pilot emerging capabilities, uh, many of which Bob had mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I think when it comes to where we're at in our journey, we're a little bit all over that spectrum that Bob presented. You know, we have our deepest experience in RPA, um, but we've been also working in the areas of fraud and fraud detection. We are uh, the primary disperser and collector of funds on behalf of the federal government. And so we have millions of records which we can analyze. Uh, we've also been looking at some areas in budget execution and particularly uh, reading and interpreting legislative language uh, to help the initial part of the budget execution process, and that's creating a warrant, which is one of the documents required for agencies to actually go out and obligate funds. Uh, and the last thing, which is probably our less mature area, is we've started to uh, explore chat technology. Uh, and the hope is that we really can get to things like natural language processing natural language generation with the chat capabilities that we've been exploring for our contact centers. Thanks and, and good morning again. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. All right, Bill, finish us off. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bill Collinson. Um, I've been at the U.S. Census Bureau since 2016. Before that, I was a director of financial management at Food and Drug Administration. Uh, very excited. Um, actually, my division is a very new division. We've been at for about 14 months. And even though we're a vertical with an office of chief financial officer, we really act more as a horizontal for support for finance budget and acquisitions when it comes to finance systems, integration, 
of mixed systems, uh, looking at technology, data analytics, uh, business process reengineering. And we're very excited um, on the path we're moving forward. Excellent. All right, welcome panelists, and thank you all for being here. Why don't we kick off the session here? If each of you could say a few words about, you know, maybe what you're most excited about and how you see um, the AI spectrum impacting your business processes moving forward. Holly, you want to kick us off? Sure. You know, RPA is, um, yeah, it's kind of a basic technology that we, that we all know how to use, but I think it opens the road to AI because the operational systems that our employees use don't have the kind of capabilities. They don't have the relational database. They don't have all of the historical data. They don't have the computing power that you need to really use AI in the real world. So RPA kind of builds a bridge between those two things. It allows our employees who are on these basic systems to access the AI capabilities on different platforms and kind of ties it all together. So it's very exciting. Okay, excellent. Bill, what about you? What are you doing at Census Bureau? What are you most excited about with uh, the future of AI? So from a maturity model, we're, we, we've moved from the crawling to the walking, probably, I would say. But at US Census Bureau, um, we've been utilizing very old technology. Our accounting system is 25 years old. We are moving to a modern one. But we, do a, we have a lot of manual processes. So obviously, the RPA piece is really great for us because we can free up people's time to stop being so much, stop being transactional and move more towards the analytical end. And so we're developing business use cases. Um, we're actually about to roll our first bot out tomorrow. Um, and then at the end of March, we'll be rolling two more out. We have about 25 business use cases. But we have a very unique business use case that um, we're actually using natural language processing. Um, a few years ago, during the financial statement audit, um, we, we, we got dinged for reporting of internal use software, which I think most of us that work in the accounting field know that um, that can be extremely subjective with people submitting and saying whether they're actually it's an enhancement or O&M. And so because of that, you know, we're trying to remove a little bit of the people part out of it and more into how can we do this more efficiently. So with the, with the natural uh, language processing, what we're doing is we're creating the logic to be able to read through like contracts and invoices to pick up and trigger those type of keywords that are in there that would, Maybe, it, maybe it's not internal use software, but it's something we need to go evaluate, right? Um, instead of waiting for the actual OIG financial statement audit to kick off, and then it's too late at that time. So we're extremely excited about that. We're not quite there yet. Um, it, it is a little complex to do it, but we're, we feel like it's going to add a tremendous amount of value. Yeah, so a little bit of proactive monitoring. Yep. Um, so again, the benefits beyond simply replacing human labor with, uh, you know, um, RPA. It's a little bit of the pro that proactive monitoring, a little bit of that, you know, uh, value added data that you, uh, that humans would normally have to spend to, to get. Yeah, and Bob, and, and just where we are right now too, is most of the people that have to report it aren't accountants, right? So we're trying to teach them SFAS 10 and every, and, and it's really difficult, right, to get them because most of them, you know, either work in the IT or a program manager or a project manager that are responsible for reporting. So we do feel like that this will, will in, uh, decrease our risk. Excellent, very good. All right, Adam, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your, you know, the excitement you have over at FIT and uh, you know, what you see with these technologies for the, the future of uh, the Department of Treasury. Sure, I wanna pick up on a word that Holly used in her, uh, her explanation of, of her excitement, which was bridge. And really what I see is the possibility here, the, the opportunity to bridge um, our automation activities together. So today we do have some automation and then we have some manual processes and we've been really trying over time to uh, bridge them, to link them together to what I call frictionless finance, meaning a full electronic uh, transaction from beginning to end with no interruption. And I see that when we take these technologies individually, like RPA for task orientation or AI that looks at cognitive things, we're going to make great strides. But when we're able to uh, weave all of these things together, I think there's a great opportunity to truly create a frictionless end-to-end -end process uh, for administrative functions at an agency. Excellent. That's something you're focused on uh, within FIT, right, Adam? Yeah, absolutely. We've been looking at end-to-end -end processes as kind of the key to getting savings, where we can have a good amount of savings with RPA individually, but really it's the integration of these processes together that are going to deliver, I think, the types of savings that we're going to need in a uh, an environment with downward pressure down appropriations. Excellent. 
All right, thank you, Adam, appreciate that. Um, let's go to one other question that I have, and then I can see some questions already starting to come in. So we'll hear from the, uh, the audience here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of these technologies on the people, uh, the people side of this, right? Like, how is this impacting your organizations? How are people adopting this? Uh, so we could, uh, we'll go to each of you to, to give a quick comment as to what you're seeing in that area, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up to some of the questions we're getting in the, uh, within, from the group. So, uh, Bill, why don't you kick us off on this one? Uh, sure. So um, from our perspective, you know, it, it, it's one of the areas that we're within our strategic plan we're trying to do is increase everyone's digital competency. So by going through these processes um, and looking where there's those business use cases to do it, whether it's NLP or AI, machine learning, RPA, um, it's getting people to start thinking a little bit more about how they do their job and and a little bit on that end-to-end -end perspective. Like we're, you know, looking across the lines and deciding like, hey, wait a minute, this is actually something we can probably um, use. And I'm going to use RPA because that really is the majority of what we're doing right now. Um, a lot of people didn't realize that you can write business rules and things like that into it, right? Whether it's direct or reimbursable appropriations and how does that work into it? It's like, well, you, yeah, you can actually build a rule into there where the bot can decide, you know, I have this rule for reimbursables for this. People didn't know that, right? So we're trying to build up their digital competencies to get them where they need to go. Um, and from the NLP for our business use case for um, the internal use software, really, again, it's, it's the safety net, right? And that's what it really is, right? You know, we've, we did a really good job, of, but the amount of effort that we had to do to get to uh, remediate and have a corrective action plan to remediate that material weakness was we put a lot of effort into it and we like, we just can't keep going down this avenue. We, we have to be able to not have so many resources looking at this. Mm. Excellent. All right. Holly, how about you at IRS? What have been some of the people impacts of these technologies? So um, technology, new technology and new processes are scary for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to do a lot of front end work to make sure that the stakeholders who are going to benefit from your, your changes are, are really bought in from the beginning. And so I want to give an example of something that we've done with that. You know, we have these estate and gift returns, which are, you know, they could be five boxes of documents. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, we couldn't, we didn't have people coming in to look at those documents anymore. So we started scanning them in. But when you've got five boxes of documents that are scanned into one file, the employees were just beside themselves. They didn't know what to do with this big chunk of sort of, you know, yeah. these pages of data. So we're using bots and we're using natural language processing to put bookmarks mm -hmm. into these returns so that you can have a table of contents and you can use your mouse to jump to the pertinent parts of the return. And this was, you know, this is something that was so valuable to everybody that we you know, we're now piggybacking on that and moving into automated classification so that our bots can not only help the people to make decisions, but, you know, use um, machine learning to engineer the, the features of each return that would merit more scrutiny. We don't have time to look at all of these. So, you know, we're using our bots to actually classify and prioritize these returns so that we can get the returns with the, the most... Uh, the, with the biggest chance of noncompliance into the hands of people first. Right. And um, it's been, of course, we don't have this quite deployed yet, but there's a lot of excitement around that. Yeah. And it's a place where we've had some very encouraging early results. So Excellent. So picking processes that people want automated is, uh, sounds like a key, uh, key motivator here. Adam, why don't you round us out from Treasury? Sure. I'm going to talk about first kind of the reaction that we've gotten from the workforce. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we're doing to kind of keep enthusiasm up. So we started out with our RPA work and it was really received initially with some skepticism. I think employees were saying, what, what is the impact on this to my job? But we involved those employees initially in the selection of which activities we would pilot. Um, and they were the ones that actually made the recommendations of things that they felt they could give away uh, in order to do more, uh, more higher value work within the organization. And along the way, we've moved to, from skepticism to curiosity to acceptance, particularly in the RPA world, where the number of bots that we're creating really is increasing very quickly. Uh, in the world of, of AI and machine learning, that's where we get into this world of uh, cognitive decision-making. And again, when we started our work in, in creating treasury warrants, which requires an accountant to read through leg, legislative language and pull out the right fields, 
it's not as easy as training a bot and saying, you know, take the first number and stick it in this box because it's not always the first number. And again, it was met by a great deal of skepticism by the analysts who do this. Uh, and as we went through the exercise, uh, the pilot of what we were trying to do, they began to see that actually the AI, the machine learning was doing an effective job of identifying what the possible fields needed to be to put onto the warrant. Uh, and that it could actually reduce a lot of the time they spend searching through these documents to find that. So we're probably in a little bit more of the curiosity phase there. But some of the things that we're doing generally in the organization to create uh, interest from our workforce is first, we've been doing what we call the Innovation Speaker Series for about four years now. So every month we bring in an individual from inside the bureau or outside of the bureau who speaks on some topic of innovation. Uh, actually, during the pandemic, uh, we've increased the numbers who participate in this to sometimes 500, 600 people in a workforce of, of 3,000. So getting 600 folks once a month to listen to this, I think, is showing that there is a great deal of interest. The other thing, which is kind of more of an active effort, is we had our first data challenge or data-thon this past year, where we gave people, anyone in the Bureau could participate, we gave them a business problem where they had to use some data analytics to come up with a pitch or a presentation uh, about how they would um, reduce carbon, the carbon footprint of, of the Bureau. Um, part of this exercise um, was giving training to everyone who wanted it in the Bureau on data analytic tools. Uh, and then they formed teams, which often were from different business areas and people didn't know one another. So we've moved from kind of this passive element of the speaker series, which we're continuing to do where people are listening mm -hmm. to more of these data thons or challenges where we're engaging anyone in the workforce who wants to participate. And again, I think that begins to break down that suspicion mm -hmm. of where does this automation lead us? Excellent, yeah, I, I think a lot of this all just comes down to that education and almost demystifying I think we saw the skepticism, to use your words, Adam, and, and some of that uh, with RPA initially. I think everyone gets that now. I mean, even seeing some of the words that uh, I, I put up on the slide at the beginning, um, they're scary. Uh, quantum computing. But when you start breaking that down into what it actually can do and start thinking about the actual use cases, the technology is not that scary. And, and bringing people in, you know, Adam, sounds like you're bringing people in who have that interest as opposed to trying to force people into it. Um, that's kind of the first step. And Bob, you know, one thing I'll say is when we did the final presentation from the Datathon, again, I said we had a workforce of roughly 3,000 people. We had 1,000 people log on for our two winners who presented out their findings. So we had a third of our workforce who was interested in the results of this effort. And we're planning our next thons. I won't say it's a Datathon, but our next challenge is for this coming year, we're hoping to do two and generate as much interest as we can from the workforce. Excellent. That sounds exciting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dial in and see that if you don't mind. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's go to some questions we're getting from the audience. And, and Bill, I'm going to direct this first one to you, uh, which is the biggest one, uh, uh, biggest question we have, which is always around the CIO bottleneck, uh, is the word used here. Um, specifically, the question is around when deploying RPA, um, but I'd like to expand that a little bit to how do you get, you know, how do you work with CIO? Um, in order to, to get these technologies through and what are some of the lessons learned you've had in your career and, and at Census. And then there's also part of that question talks about deploying bots or technology in the cloud. So I don't know if you've addressed or thought about that as you've kind of gone through your, uh, your spectrum. So if you could address those, that'd be great. Sure, so, so at Census and within my organization, um, we have a, a phenomenal relationship with our CIO director. They're great, they're trusted partners with us. But there was a little skepticism at first, right? When we went in there and, you know, had a couple in the IT security, are they going to be attended or unattended? I'm like, well, why was that? Ma why should that matter, right? You know, it's, yeah. you have nightly batch processing that runs like E2 travel that comes through, right? How is that any different with having, mm -hmm. you know, it, it come through? So, so I think get it, and probably the lessons learned for us was to get out more in front of it with them before we started. We kind of jumped into it a little bit early mm -hmm. and then started looking at the infrastructure piece and working through, you know, making sure that um, security was okay with what we're doing, making sure there was audit trails and those type of things. That, that was a little bit of a hurdle at times. But again, we, we get along great, so it wasn't too bad, but, but definitely 
have those conversations earlier rather than later before you start going out and buying the software and doing those type of things because um, having that partnership with doing that is great. And, and we are making moves towards the cloud, not with RPA or AI yet, mm -hmm. um, but they're the, uh, I think everyone realizes we're just moving there now. You know, I think when it first came out in 2009 and all, everyone was a little bit skeptical about it. And I think now it's a lot more easier way to gravitate, especially with the, you know, a lot of stuff out there now is FedRAM certified moderate, which makes it a lot easier to get to where you need to go. So. Yeah, excellent. All right. Yeah, the, um, I would say the movement to the cloud provides a lot of benefit, but I also think that's a little scary for people to, to grasp as well. Maybe losing some of that control of some of those technologies or the feel of that going to an right. external cloud provider. And especially when you work in a, um, in a bureau that has a lot of sensitive information in there, right? Even though we don't touch that sensitive information, there's already a natural, um, you know, risk adverse. You, you want to be a little bit more risk adverse and I appreciate that about them. And so I always go in with that mindset when I go work with them and say, look, this is what we want to do. How can you help me get there and, and, and getting through it? But, but honestly, it was, it was actually easier than I thought it was going to be. Excellent, yeah. excellent. All right, um, Holly, I'm going to direct the next question to you. You may or may not be able to answer, but there is a lot of interest over facial recognition yes. at the IRS. So the question is pretty long, talking about the, the leap to that, the technology decision. Um, what, if you could say a few words about your experience with it or your understanding of it, I think that'd be helpful and, and definitely within the scope of this conversation. Right, so full disclaimer here, I was not involved in that procurement um, but I know that there's been a lot of controversy. Um, we have, you know, we're, we're in a very sensitive cycle in our appropriations discussions right now. The IRS was hoping to get a big influx of resources this fiscal year um, to cope with some of the excess workload. And, you know, that was a barrier that the, the media storm that blew up over that ID.me really kind of put a big rock in the road there. It's, it's complicated our budget negotiations quite a bit. Um, and one of the things that we're working on is a workaround. So we recognize that that's sensitive. Um, we have the contract in place and we are working on alternate paths so that if a person is uncomfortable with uploading an image of their face, they don't want to use that, um, they will have a number to call where they can authenticate themselves in a different way by giving information a more traditional, a little bit more costly way, but sure. we're going to provide an alternate path to that. And we hope that our stakeholders will um, we hope that that will satisfy our stakeholders as far as doing due diligence with the, you know, the genuine concerns that some people have with the ID facial recognition. Sure. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and I think that's a great example of that user adoption, you know, understanding, um, and, and this is a hurdle and, and probably unknown even with this technology, the security of the information, right. you know, what happens to that information as it's stored? Is it stored in a cloud? How is it protected? These are all the hurdles that you are now, we were able to hide behind RPA saying, RPA just accesses your current systems. It's not storing data or doing much. It, it'll temporarily transfer information. But now you're talking about new technologies that are crossing into some of those boundaries and, and creating a lot of uh, you know, potential issues with the user community. And you have to realize that with AI, there's an increased risk of, of algorithmic bias, right? The data, that you, the data that you feed into the algorithm, the data with which you train the algorithm is, uh, can be compromised in so many ways. It can yeah. be completely unintentional. But you know, the data that we have is a compilation of thousands of people over the last 20 years making decisions. And if those decisions are biased, then the results that we're modeling on to try and reproduce those results are going to be biased. So there's an increased responsibility that we have to be ethical and to make sure that we're not having these disparate impacts. And we, we have to acknowledge that and, and make sure that we put safeguards in place. Absolutely. Oh, ethical AI. We could probably have a whole different panel to talk about ethical AI. Maybe we will in the future. But, um, but yeah, great point, Holly. And, and thank you for addressing that. I know that was a little bit of a left field question for you. Um, Adam, let's go over to you. There is a question that, um, about the role of the QSMO in achieving your frictionless finance and, and can the QSMO be an accelerator? So if you wouldn't mind uh, talking a little bit about your perspective on that and maybe some of your involvement with the QSMO. Sure. So I'm very closely tied in with the QSMO because a lot of the work that my office is doing in the world of standards uh, are the standards that the FM QSMO is using to establish its marketplace. And so as that marketplace gets established, I think there's going to be a great role in them identifying solutions that are available in the marketplace to, uh, to enable that frictionless finance kind of uh, objective that we have here. 
And I think that evaluating solutions based upon their ability to move information seamlessly from one place to another is a key part. One of the things that we were working on with them, uh, and it was in uh, the RFI they had issued, I think back last year, was uh, what's called a business information exchange, which was essentially a set of government-specific APIs uh, for things like invoices or collections or uh, any type of transaction where we move information from one system to another system and creating a standard that everyone will follow. Because one of the things people may not realize is today we don't follow a standard. And I think travel might be the, the, the most known example where essentially we have 50 plus installs of the different travel systems and each one of them is using different business rules and different layouts to move the information. And so that's gonna be a key part of the marketplace that they're setting up to move the information more seamlessly. Mm. Excellent, good, good usage of that as well, thank you. Um, there's some interest around chatbot technology and conversational AI technology. So I think a couple of you talked a little bit about dabbling in that um, in your intros. So I'll, I'll let you guys decide who wants to address it, but the, the exact question, um, oh, I've lost it now. The exact question talks a little bit about um, um, what technologies are you using and would you, and or would recommend to implement a chatbot? So there's interest in technologies. Um, and if you haven't looked at an individual vendor, maybe some of the use cases you see for, for conversational AI in the future. So we don't, ha I don't have any, so I don't Okay. Have <laughs> All right, Holly? I haven't been involved in chatbots either, I'm sorry. Okay. So. Adam? <laughs> I can chat all day about this. So we, we actually, Adam is the voice actually, of some chatbots, as a matter of fact, right, Adam? I am. I mean, people say that the voice is very powerful. So uh, actually, we've been looking at chat capabilities for a couple of years. One of the things that we started out with was looking at, you know, we have lots of contact centers and whether we could consolidate our contact centers together. Um, but one of the things that we learned is that the function of each contact center is very different that a lot of our uh, representatives can't necessarily switch from like a retail security over to a debt collection that easily. So it's not like I'm switching from, you know, one uh, apparel store to another where, you know, it's really apparel to apparel. Uh, we don't have that kind of apples to apples comparison. Uh, this past year, what we started doing is before we looked at technology, and I want to emphasize that before we looked at technology, we had to start looking at what information we had within the Bureau uh, to leverage for the chat capabilities uh, and what format that information was in. And so what we learned is the following. Uh, there are call scripts at the different contact centers, but not everyone follows them. And not every one of those call scripts, call scripts are uh, electronically stored. Uh, and so one of the things in order for to make chat successful is we need to be able to access the data in order for us to do this. Uh, the bot doesn't know what to say unless I give it some script for which to do it. So the first step in this chat um, uh, exploration that we're doing is really looking at the data uh, and where that data is, what format it needs to be in. And I would say this is something with any emerging technology that we took at, look at, is we really need to look at the process before we start asking about the technology. The technology is fascinating, it really is, and I know we all wanna get our hands on it, but what we're learning is that when we go right to the technology, we miss the opportunity to make the business better. And really the business is the emphasis that we need to have. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. And I would say my experience with it, um, the, the our RPA vendors, or at least the ones that are most prevalent, specifically in the public sector, have a lot of similarities. And I would say as you move to any of these other technologies, including chat, there are uh, distinct differences into which you know vendors are better at certain functions and what information uh, can be accessed and, and even what types of chat bots you should be talking about. Um, so to lead with the vendor, so, you know, when you start talking about thinking about some of these other technologies may not be the best usage of, uh, you know, Adam, to your point, looking at the process first and then exploring what capabilities are out in the market. And I think that's been we've seen that time and time again. And then even with chat capabilities, um, you know, we, we call it more conversational AI as well, because I think the chat capabilities, you think you pick up the phone and you get an automated operator on the other end who can only answer yes, no questions. And I think the technology has matured to a point where you're talking about 
you know, online chats, your phone, if you're banking with your phone and you're talking to a digital assistant, um, Q&A bots, you know, sentiment analysis um, chat capabilities. These are all where this technology is going. Um, so there is much more than that traditional yes, no, let me get you to an operator type of, uh, of chat bot that I think is where it all started. And Bob, you know, I'll add to this too, which is if I'm doing an online chat on my computer or I'm going through a phone, remember, it's the same script. Yep. And we need that data. We need that information digitized. They're not reading off of different scripts for those two capabilities. The other thing is once you get that data digitized, then the, the, the solution set that you're using becomes clearer because a lot of this isn't custom technology. It's off the shelf, mm -hmm. but it needs the data. That's, the, that's what makes this stuff run. And again, we don't want to jump too soon. We don't want to start with a bot where we need to do authentication of a user first. Yeah. We want to start with like more of a Q&A bot uh, because authentication brings in so many other issues that we need to overcome and we'd spend too much time trying to solve that and not enough time learning the chat capability. And Bob, I want to cut in here for sure, a minute because I am involved in somewhat, uh, in, in, in somewhat storing the data that, that, all, uh, that you all are talking about here. It's really expensive and you have to factor that in at the beginning, especially if you're using a cloud provider and you're going to be paying every time you access your data, you really have to build that into the cost of the project and you have to have enough data to run the algorithms. You know, big data is called big data for a reason. It's, you have to collect enough data, you have to store it in a way that it can be accessed, and that, is, that can be very expensive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great point, Holly, and I think that's a key part of this entire discussion is, is around, you know, what, what are, how do you value the impacts of these technologies going forward, right? Is it, a, is it a dollar savings thing, or is it looking at the potential impact to your customers or to your processes? And I think as we move up that scale, we're seeing a shift in that conversation. Not to say money isn't important. We all know it is, right? Um, but you know, we're seeing a shift in that conversation. And when you think about potentially large use cases that have these large impacts, um, spending time digitizing data, spending time going to the cloud, spending time researching the right technologies is going to make that process so much better and faster that you know, you're not just implementing a technology. You're actually changing the lives of, of you know, the customers and the users of your services. And working within the systems architecture so that you don't get on the wrong side of the CIO. So there's a whole big minefield you have to kind of get around to, to do all this right. Yeah, yeah. there was a bunch of questions around uh, you know, data digitization, um, antiquated systems, connecting data, connecting information. I'd be interested um, in, in any of your perspectives on you know, how you've addressed that or what problems maybe you've run into and haven't figured out yet. So, Bill, do you want to? Yeah, so for us, because again, we're, we're still working on our infrastructure piece, we've actually are going to plan B, which is um, we're going to have individual users um, use v, uh, persistent VDI temporarily until we get our infrastructure in place. So it's a little bit of a, a phase one, phase two to get it to where we need to go because we are a little bit behind on the infrastructure piece um, with getting that done. But the one thing I did want to add, if, 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 if you don't mind, is I know we're talking about a lot about the technology. One thing that we also had to, we have to really assess now, and we're doing it, is our workforce, right? You know, the type, you know, we, I'm about half 510 system accountants and the other is 501s, right? But we did hire last year our first two data scientists, which lots of times you don't see come into the finance field, right? Or budget field, because we see a lot of value in doing that. And we're also updating a lot of our position, position descriptions that start talking about where are these capabilities that, you know, that people need to possess in order to come in to allow us to leverage that technology to go where we need to go, because otherwise, you know, we either have to train them to get to where they need to go, which is great, but at the same time, we also need to go out there and hire people that have those skill sets. Yeah, awesome, great point. Hey, Bob. Hey, Rob, how are you? Good, how are you? Hey, yeah, glad, that, glad we could get you online uh, for this. Bob, we're, um, you know, we, we've, we've done a, a, a nice talk here about, um, you know, going beyond RPA a bit. Do you want to give a quick introduction and talk a little bit about what you're doing within, uh, within Tennessee? Sure, I apologize for my hoarseness. Um, yeah, so I'm Bob Pucci. I'm the executive director um, in the state of Tennessee. Uh, we're taking on the governor's initiative to um, roll out uh, process automation across across the state. So we're not just doing it by agency or by um, division or department, but horizontally across the whole state. Um, so I'm leading the, the team, the selection of the vendors, the, um, leading the design and the scope and and building out the solutions and deployment. So in center, setting up center, center of excellence and all the infrastructures, disaster recovery, et cetera. 
So I'm doing that. Um, so where we are now, you want to know where we are? I mean, we, yeah, why don't you give us a little bit? I know you're, you're, you're doing a lot with RPA, Center of Excellence. You're standing up in a, you know, a, a, a statewide program yeah. to take advantage of it. Why don't you talk a little bit about maybe what you see the future um, you know, after kind of putting the bots in? What are some other technologies you might think about exploring? Yeah, so what we're doing is we, you know, we first set up a foundation. We felt so we could really use Agile and move very quickly. Center of Excellence and, and, and um, what we call an intelligent automation um foundation and then um we started with um rpa but now we're looking at ai ocr and some of the other um uh you know a little bit of ml so that's kind of where we are right now so right now the way it works at the state is we have an organization that evaluates the additional components we're going to bring under our umbrella so that's underway right now and then we'll be procuring them around um um, fiscal year 23 in the beginning, so around August, September timeframe, and then dovetailing them into our um, our solution that'll include um, obviously robotic process automation and um, um, you know OCR, AI, and some other things. So that's what we're doing right now. We're going to have about in less than 10 months, we're going to have uh, over 40 over 40 um, processes automated. So it's um, pretty you know pretty rapid, um, which equates to about 55 automations. Um, and we started looking at really shared services, which is, you know, it's a shared service that affects all 23 agencies in the, in the state. So it's really big bang from um, efficiency perspective. So that's kind of what we're, um, we're doing right now. So. Excellent. Well, I'm glad, uh, glad to hear it. I know you've done some amazing, and all this within like the last year, right, Bob? I mean, this has been kind of the. Like, yeah, pretty, yeah, we yeah. actually, um, uh, we picked the software um, in May and then, um, <clears throat> started with um you know you know all the stuff contracts but actually started hitting the ground around august 15th so yeah, it's been we'll, we'll be all production by um mid-july you know awesome. late july so pretty very pretty good. fast pretty fast so very good all right we probably have time for one more question then we'll do a quick wrap up um there is a lot of question around um you know the shift to implementing ai and the impact on employee morale and, and employee excitement I know, Adam, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the data-thon that you guys did. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, kind of the impact of the people and, and how we, you all got them excited. But I wonder if, uh, if you have any upcoming at, um, items or ways that you're planning to engage your users um, or, or your customers, I would say, to, uh, to get them more excited about this and, and you know, give some ideas to the, to the audience. Um, uh, Holly, you want to start? Um, I think, you know, it, we're, we're right now at the IRS on kind of a burning platform where there aren't enough people to do anything. So, you know, the, the whole, one of our bots uh, does compliance checks on certified professional employer organizations which file employment tax on behalf of employers. And we don't have the, the people to do the checks that are required. So it was a really easy sell. It, it, it's looking for those opportunities. You know, it, when people are shorthanded all over the place, they're sort of, you know, they'll, they'll grab any rope you throw out there to help. <laughs> yeah. So I'm lucky to be in a place where there's so much opportunity to automate and so, so much open-mindedness to try new things. Yeah, I don't think you're, uh, IRS is the only place that has that issue. So I think uh, you were seeing that all over the place and just that opportunity to backfill, you know, the backlog of, of processes that aren't being processed. So excellent point. Bill? Yeah, so for us, I was really grateful that um, most of the folks within OCFO um, extremely excited about where we're going with this, right? And I think a lot of people are kind of inundated with, you know, a lot of manual transactions for the RPA piece or the, the extra yard they have to go for reporting internal use software and some of those pressures. I think it's been very, um, everyone's been very receptive, but we've been setting up series of uh, workshops to try to introduce people to the technology and give them the business use cases. So we grew from three business use cases to 25 in about two months, right? So people are now starting to brainstorm and go, hey, I think I could do this. And then they say, hey, what about if I if we implement the bot, but then when I still have to go do the error, the phase two, we could implement machine learning where it, it you can teach it through the algorithm how to actually go fix the error. And I'm like, that's exactly where we need to go with that. And um, it's been going along terrifically. I'm yeah. very, very excited for where we're going. We've set up some other groups uh, like seeds of data, which even though a lot of it's around data analytics, it does you know bleed into the other areas of machine learning and AI also. So Excellent. we're very excited. We're just, just trying to give them opportunities to expose them to it. Yeah, so leading with the process, empowering them to right. figure out how they want to use it going forward has created a good buzz. Adam, I know you've got a bunch going on. Any, any, anything else you want to mention around uh, driving employee morale at Treasury? 
Um, well, you know, what I want to talk about is kind of, yeah, so specifically, so one, you all heard it first here. You heard Tammy uh, Periello and Tim Gribben speak yesterday. They haven't even heard this. Uh, so you heard it first at AGA. Um, we are going to be pitching to our leadership pretty soon uh, another thon, another challenge, which in effect, we'd be leveraging this kind of concept of frictionless finance. And so what we want to do is ask the workforce to come together in integrated teams uh, and help create a frictionless end-to-end -end process that would involve all of them. And we would start that out by actually providing them training in what we call our digital end-to-end -end efficiency methodology, which is available on the web. And Deloitte actually helped us build it. Uh, so again, we'd be integrated some training in this. So we train people how to apply the methodology. And then we build some integrated teams to come back to us with ideas on how we can create frictionless and where we can deliver greater savings to uh, the government and the organization. Awesome. Very exciting. Cool. Bob, how about you? Uh, how about employee morale uh, around these technologies in the state of Tennessee? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we definitely had a little bit of concern. Uh, people were worried about losing their employment. Um, but we, I think we, you know, it always could be a better job, but given an awareness that we were, um, it was pretty much, you know, look at a more quality type of work to do. Um, so we really had to get ahead of OCM and let them know that, you know, they, these are the types of work they can do. So I think management needs to say, okay, well, what are they going to do now that they're not doing these mundane eight hour <laughs> typing, uh, you know, uh, screens? Um, so once we started doing that and, and people actually started feeling pretty good because they saw the you know, the lack of rework, for example, because of the data quality coming through, et cetera. So, you know, instead of 30 to 40 percent, 50 percent rework, they all had their free time. So it's a better quality product. So they were feeling I think the morale was going up because they were able to help their citizens and their coworkers much, much more efficiently. So excellent. Yeah, I think that's that's been a very natural feel. And, and I think I'm hearing it from each of you as well as a, you know, on this spectrum when you're, you're bringing in you know, the opportunity to make people's lives better, change how they work every day instead of replace them or instead of, you know, kind of uh, um, introduce new technologies that are scary. It's all about making the workplace a little bit better place to live. And I think that that's a big focus specifically in the times we're in right now. Um, giving that comfort, giving tools and giving people the opportunity to succeed um, seems to be winning out um, with these technologies. All right, we are wrapping up here. I'm going to give everyone 30 seconds to say a final word and then we're going to wrap up. I can't believe the time has gone this quickly. Um, Adam, I'm going to kick it over to you to say a final word, and we'll go to each of our panelists. Yeah, uh, I think my final word is, you know, emerging technology is great and interesting and exciting, uh, but at the end of the day, start with the process and then figure out the technology because that business process is really where the opportunities to save is, uh, and, and I think we'll all go far doing it that way. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. Bill? Yeah, so just to piggyback on that, I think one of the big other lessons learned that we um, clean up your business process to see whether there's actually a business use case before you start exploring it also. Um, we did have to spend a lot of time, you know, improving those, re-engineering some of those processes before we went in there. But I'm very excited and I feel very blessed to work where I do because it's it's a very exciting times right now for us. And, and we're really seeing the revolution really take off at Census, so. Excellent. Bob, how about you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I echo what the team is saying. Um, you know, we kind of got caught where we're actually doing standardization and optimization before we do process optimization, right? So, so it's uh, or auto before we do process um, automation. Um, but um, I, I think one of the, the key lessons learned is um, you, you can't do this in you know an isolated or a vacuum. You really need to you know make the, all the other sister organizations mm -hmm. um, cognizant and aware. And, and some skin in the game. I mean, the reason why we've been able to move at lightning speed is we roughly have probably eight to nine organizations all with skin in the game and helping us with building the infrastructures, you know, procurement moving quickly, et cetera. So, <clears throat> and then also all the, you know, the, the resources you need, the such many resources that know all of the systems that you're gonna be integrating with, right? So if you don't have those allocated in, inside your organization, yeah, you're gonna have, you're gonna hit a lot of walls. Right. So it's, it's definitely that pre-planning and and everyone wants everyone wants to be included. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, it's an empowerment, you know, upper management, middle management, et cetera. So that's something that you really need to do. And, um, and that clear, you know, clears the clears the road, I think. So. Excellent. Thank you.
Holly, last but not least, take us home. And, you know, explaining this, you're going to find yourself explaining over and over what it is that you're doing. You know, AI isn't a black box. It can be explained in terms that everybody can understand. I mean, most of us are lucky in finance organizations to work with a very numerate set of stakeholders. And so, you know, if you explain, this is, you know, just a, a matrix, and, and, and we're looking at we're looking at outliers within this matrix, matching each line item to each line item. People understand that, and then it's not as scary to them. So, um, I love that. Take yeah. the time. Take the time to find out who the stakeholders are, and just keep explaining over and over again. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it, you're right. These technologies are not scary. Um, RPA may have been scary to, to many of you um, in the room and listening, and, and think about where you are with it now, and, and how much benefit it's bringing you, bringing to you. That's where this is going with these new, um, you know, intelligent automation and AI technologies. Um, and, and this train is moving. Um, the, these are uh, um, going to be new technologies you're already seeing. It's going to continue to improve the work that we do day to day. Um, and, it, and most importantly, in the public sector, it's going to be something that, you know, we can obviously uh, look at to help taxpayer dollars and improve services to, to constituents and, and, you know, move the country forward. So. Um, it's a very exciting time right now. I would like to say thank you to my panelists, um, Bill and Holly, for being here, and, and Bob and Adam for being um, on the Zoom uh, call. That's 2022, living it uh, real time right here. Um, so thank you very much for being here today. And um, thank you to, the, to, uh, to everyone for all of your questions, and, and hopefully this was very helpful to you all.